So Tony, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, you are our guest speaker today on the GoToMeeting Live view and Facebook Live view. We want to ask you a question. So when it comes down to your wonderful resume, what you've done, who you are, and what you know, Tony Ballard, everybody, has been involved in the field of communications for nearly four decades. After spending 10 years as a speech language pathologist, he was chosen to join the faculty of St. Petersburg College as a professor of speech communication. After having taught courses that centered on public speaking for 10 years, Mr. Ballard saw a need for a course in interpersonal communication at the college. He was then appointed to spearhead the creation of the curriculum for interpersonal communication. He has continued to teach in both the fields of public speaking and interpersonal communication. Mr. Ballard takes great pleasure in emphasizing the common principles of effective spiritual living and effective communication. With that said, Mr. Tony Ballard, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Ballard. Hope you're not disappointed. <laughs> Hope everyone is doing well out there this morning. And uh, as you can see, uh, today we're going to be looking at speech, meaning public speaking. Uh, it's one of those things that I think for uh, that often we take for granted. And um, we know when we've heard a good speaker, um, and we know when we've heard someone who probably left us a little nonplussed. And, 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 and when that occurs, a lot of times we don't think about it. And that's the thing, we just don't think about it at all. We could you know, name any number of people that we know, I'm sure everyone has, can, can come up with their own list of uh, people when we talk about who are some effective public speakers. Well, it might surprise you, or maybe it wouldn't surprise you to know that those people that we see as effective public speakers, many of them, in fact, I would dare say all of them, are really pulling from a group of um, strategies, uh, some that have to do with delivery, some that have to do with preparation of a message uh, that culminate in an effective uh, connecting, an effective uh, event, if you will, let's just call it a communication event, uh, between themselves and a listening audience, whether that audience is, you know, one or two people or a, or, or a stadium full of people. So today we're going to be looking at public speaking in a ritualistic way, and that's why uh, you see this slide that says the speech ritual. Often, we might, not, we might not think of every speech as being ritualistic, and yet there are ritualistic factors in every speech. Uh, and whether we're talking about speech, the, the, the speech that we might not even think of uh, as a speech. Um, think about it. You're, you've just arrived at work and maybe you're in the break room or you're waiting for the supervisor or maybe you are the supervisor who has to come in and tell everyone what's going to be happening for the next eight hours or however long the shift may be. So you have those people sitting there listening to that person talking. It's extremely informal, of course, and yet it is still a speech. It is still a speech. And so when the uh, speech event, if you will, goes well, certain things occur. One of the main things that occurs is uh, we leave all having, at least in general, an idea of the same message. We, we all have interpreted it in generally the same way. So let's talk a little bit about this speech ritual. First of all, let's talk about what a ritual is. As you can see, a ritual is any practice or any pattern of behavior that is regularly performed in a set manner. There is a, a repetitiveness to it, a predictability to it, even though all of these events don't seem predictable. There is a predictability to it. Okay, uh, we'll just leave that as it is. And there are rules. Okay, the rules aren't always the same, but there are rules, a prescribed code of behavior regulating social conduct. And so when we look at public speaking, that's why we can look at it and think of it as a ritual. Uh, no matter what may be the setting or the venue or whether the speech is planned or unplanned, there are pre-existing expectations that we have, even if we don't all agree totally on, on what our expectations may be. 
Okay, so so once again, yeah, we're looking at this from a ritualistic standpoint because uh, when we're talking about uh, public speaking situations, there are certain aspects of it that are always ritualistic, whether we look at it that way or not. And for the effective speaker, they are aware of this, whether they think of it as a ritual or not, but they are aware of this and they prepare with that in mind. They prepare with their audience in mind. They prepare with the circumstances in mind. Where am I speaking? And so forth. Now, when we're talking about these rituals, we are sharing. I mean, that's, that's why people come together to hear speakers. Think about right now, this is, a, <laughs> this is really a wonderful time to use as an example as a communications professor. The most we can do now, thank God for Zoom and go to a meeting and so forth and so on. Because what we're really trying to do is overcome the challenge of actually coming together and sharing space. Why do we want to share space? Because we're social beings. We need to share space because we need to connect. We need to connect. And so uh, because of, of course, the current situation and so forth, Obviously, there are a lot of challenges that uh, are basically right there in front of us and our need to connect. Think about those challenges and the lengths that people are going to. Some are just ignoring the risks. They want to connect with other people so bad. So you have people that are protesting and so forth and so on. You have people that are actually giving speeches about this. But the point is, we need to connect and public speeches help us do that. Okay. And so in this particular case right here, uh, yeah, we're using technology to try and, you know, circumvent uh, the uh, difficulties that are, uh, that are you know, in, our, in, in front of us today. And so uh, every time we come together, again, what we're doing is we're sharing in a ritual. We are sharing in a ritual. And in that ritual, there are functional roles. There are things that people are expected to do. There are behavioral expectations that, that we all bring into these situations, whether we're aware of it or not. And there is a, an, a psychological dimension of this whole thing that happens. When it goes well, when it goes well, uh, we come away with what we might call a sense of psychological, appeal, a sense of satisfaction. Okay, when it doesn't go well, uh, we might not necessarily come away totally displeased, but we do come away feeling like, eh, didn't quite do it for me. Okay, so let's talk about the, the functional roles first in, in rituals. Uh, as far as the functional roles in the speech ritual, uh, we, number one, there, there are duties that we have that, help, that just help make it happen. Because when we get together, we have objectives. We have goals, and they might not even be defined but we do have goals, okay? Uh, think about every time that you reach out to someone for whatever reason, you have a reason for it. Maybe it's social, maybe it's to get information, maybe it's to meet some kind of a ceremonial objective, but you have reasons for doing it. And so when we, when we uh, think about the part that we play or the parts that we play in these rituals, in the speech ritual in particular right now, uh, well, yeah, everyone has duties. Everyone has duties, okay? And what we all are expected to do is do what we can to make this ritualistic experience, to make it successful, okay? So that we can all come away with satisfaction. The reason that, that this is very important is when you think about it, often as a listener or an audience member, We'll go into a public speaking situation, certainly with our expectations, certainly. But what we're often not thinking about is that we have responsibilities too, and we're going to be talking about those. Okay, so everyone has duties, and the duties that we have in these uh, uh, settings, in these uh, ritualistic settings, are all for the purpose of enhancing the experience. Enhancing the experience. Um, to give you an example of when things don't go well, let's, let, let's take it away from public speaking. Everyone has probably been to a movie somewhere. If you've ever been to a movie and you're sitting there in that big theater watching the big screen, 
everyone understands that there are certain rules that we are supposed to be following. Don't talk today, don't text, don't, you know, guys, silence your phone, you make sure you do all of those things. When we do those things, we are falling in line with the expectations of the experience. But we've all probably had those situations where someone didn't respect uh, those ritualistic rules. And we might not be the kind of person that says anything, but it breaks the experience for us. We want that person to put their phone away. We want them to make sure that it's silenced and so forth. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, everyone has responsibilities. We come into these situations with very specific expectations in mind, and that's a part of the ritual. Some of these expectations are based on the traditions that we are used to, based on the culture that we uh, were raised and conditioned in, based on some historical factors that may be a part of uh, the group that we grew up as a part of, or groups that we have been a part of, and also personal experiences. Some of these behavioral expectations are also based on just our personal preferences. I like to use, um, I like to use examples uh, from different forms of worship. I grew up in the South, Southern United States, and uh, North Carolina, to be exact, and uh, my upbringing was actually a Southern Baptist. And so my father would take us to different churches. Now I'll go ahead and tell you, the church that we went to uh, regularly, the minister was pretty good as far as speaking is concerned, but he was what my father called a lecturing minister. Basically you would go and hear him and, you would, and his delivery style was very much like what you're listening to right now, okay? Um, and that was fine. But when he wanted to hear something that was more dynamic, something uh, much more charismatic, if you will, we went to a different church. And, and the general term that was used was this, this minister, whoever it was, was, that was good preaching. And yet, some of the very behaviors that these people called good preaching would be out of place in certain other uh, situations. So when we're talking about traditions and so forth in regards to the speech ritual, the traditions aren't always the same, okay? They're going to vary based on the people's traditions, based on their experiences, and again, again based on uh, their own preferences, okay? And we can't always get in line all on the same as far as our expectations are concerned, but uh, a lot of times we can soften our expectations that are based on our own uh, personal experiences, and we can kind of get on board with what a larger group would find acceptable. Now, let's move on to the psychological dimension. In a public speaking situation, if it's going well, there's going to be a connection between the participants, okay? There's going to be an effective connection between the speaker and the audience, but guess what? There's also going to be a connection among audience members. They might not be aware of it, but think about, let's say a comedian. When a comedian is on stage and if they're really hitting it that night, everybody's laughing at the same time, okay? You might have that person who, who laughs out of place and it kind of throws things off. Those people are connected in ways that they're not consciously thinking about, but of course they are. They are connected. Now let's take it away from that situation and look at some other types of maybe uh, more formal public speaking situations. We know we're supposed to sit in general. We know we're supposed to be generally quiet depending on where you are, okay? Uh, again, having grown up in the Southern Baptist tradition, quiet was not what people wanted in many of these of our gatherings. They wanted the people in the audience to talk back to the minister, preach, preach, Rev, that kind of a thing, amen. But imagine doing that in another setting where it would be considered inappropriate, okay? So there is a connection between the participants and there's this agreement where, yeah, we're going to be following certain rules. We're going to be following certain rules and we don't have to talk about it, but there's sort of a non-discussed contract of what will be deemed appropriate behavior in these situations. Now these rules don't just apply to the audience members, they also apply to the speaker 
we come with those expectations. Okay, so again, you have that that connection between the participants in the audience, but also between the speaker and the audience. Again, this is especially if the speaker is 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 effective, is effective. Okay. Um, so uh, when we're talking about that emotional connection, what everyone is supposed to be bringing into the public speaking situation is a sense of empathy. Okay, that ability to connect with other people and understand what they are going through. Empathy sounds like sympathy, but they are not. They are not the same thing. You know, when we try and understand what someone is going through, what someone else is trying to express, well, then we're experiencing empathy. Uh, a little interesting uh, point about uh, you know using this uh, um, technology to be able to connect with one another is obviously we're on the internet. Well, one thing that is very common, uh, as you know, on the internet is uh, some people really act out. There's a lot of negative behavior that goes on on the internet. This is the result of people lacking empathy because they are not face to face with the person that they might be spewing their venom to. Now, that, that type of behavior generally uh, is less common in face-to-face -face situations because we see the immediate reaction of the other communicators, okay? The speaker sees the immediate reaction of the audience members, and we often have this sense of when we're connecting or when we're not connecting, okay? Now, the effective speaker is, is, is very much aware of this, but guess what? The audience members are aware of it too. It might be more on a deeper level or at least a, a more on a subconscious or even an unconscious level, but they are aware of it. When all of these things actually are occurring, what we're trying to do is reach the same objective, no matter what the topic, no matter what the venue, no matter what the purpose. We all decided, let's go to one place, most of us will sit. The person doing the speaking is going to stand in front or maybe even in the center. And while that person is delivering one continuous message, the rest of us are going to listen and respond appropriately. All this for the purpose of what we hope to be shared understanding. In the end, the hope is, yes, we all heard the same general message based on our own you know, uh, differences and our own uh, uh, backgrounds and so forth, we might have interpreted a little bit differently, but the hope is that we will all come to the same conclusion uh, at the end of the message that we've heard. So again, in these shared rituals, do we need to think about these things? It's not as if we're going to dwell on them. The speaker will think about them much more than the audience members, but the audience members are also, they carry some responsibility in these rituals, and this is what we're trying to point out right now. Okay. Now, uh, what about the ritualistic factors of the speech itself, or let's say the message itself? First and foremost, the message has to be clear. This is uh, often easier said than done. It's very, very common that um, you know a speaker shares their message. I hope this isn't happening now, but you share the, the message, you think you've been clear, and yet at the end, you get all these questions uh, about things that maybe to you were simple, if you were the speaker, and yet you wonder, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they get it? It may have been any number of reasons, but some of it might have been a lack of clarity in the design of the message. Audiences come expecting a very clear message, and in that clarity of message, there are basically just three parts. There has to be a beginning, there has to be the middle, which is developed, and then there has to be a clear ending, so that when the message is over, Again, we come away with a sense of uh, completeness. I've heard a full message, okay? But in order to reach that result, there has to be some real clarity. There's clarity in the event. People know where to sit, they know where to go, they know when things are going to start and when they end, and also there should be clarity in the message. Also, and this is again more of these ritualistic factors, time matters. Time matters. It is determined by why are we here? What's the function of this speech? And don't get me wrong, a lot of the things about time are, are determined on a personal level, you know, but in general, people again come with expectations of how long something is supposed to last, how long the message is supposed to last. 
and many of their expectations are based on you know, their their views based on their again their personal experience what am i used to how long am i used to sitting and i'll go ahead and tell you that younger people today have more of a problem listening to an extended message okay and the reason is because of the fact that their listening habits have been shaped in a very different way because of technology and so when we come together and we you know that the, the, that will affect or, or does have an effect on the methods and, and strategies that a speaker has to use to hold people's attention because again the audience depending on their uh, personal attributes age personal experience knowledge level and so forth uh, they bring their own set of, of experiential factors and their own level of knowledge and even their own preferences that affect what they want to uh, listen to who they want to listen to what will be the uh, speaking style of the of the presenter and so forth and so on you have to face the fact that as a speaker you are using other people's time okay and this is one of those things I try and get across to my students all the time is let's say that you put together a very poorly poorly planned message now let's say your speech was only five minutes long and you've got 20 people in the audience okay maybe you forgot you had to give this speech and you just kind of threw it together and you figure I can kill five minutes well, when, if you did that, you didn't kill five minutes. You killed five minutes plus five times 20, okay? Because you also killed or wasted the time of everyone that decided to come and listen to you. And so it's for these reasons that as simple as this stuff is, the speaker has to consider, how long should my message be? How long should my message be? No matter how important it is, how much can I really expect my audience to truly listen? Not merely sit and be polite, because sometimes they'll slide into that, but to truly listen. Okay. Also, uh, the speaker, again, we, we mentioned speaking styles, but you really need to think about what should my speaking style be in relation to my audience? I once heard a speech professor say that, okay, if you were going to tell the story of the three bears, to uh, some, uh, let's say, kindergartners. You tell the story that most people know. All righty, there's the three bears eating their porridge. Porridge is too hot. They go for a walk. Goldilocks comes along while they're gone and goes in. And if you know the story, you know how it played out. But if you take away the details, <laughs> The story of the three bears is really a story of trespassing and illegal entry and uh, destruction of property and so forth and so on. So again, it's going to change. The details are going to change. The elaborateness is going to change. The complexity of, of the message is going to change depending on the audience. You certainly wouldn't go to a group of children and talk to them about breaking and entering and so forth. You would put it at their level. Well, that doesn't change with adults. We have to make sure that no matter how much we know about our topic, we have to gauge the level that the audience can really handle our information. And this is more challenging than it may seem to be. Uh, we have to remember there was a time that whatever, how, no matter how complex this information is, there was a time that I did not know this. There was a time that it was new for me. What is the level that I can reasonably expect my audience to be functioning at so that I can plan my message for a level that they can really comprehend? And so that's another thing that we need to consider. All those human factors are a part of this ritual of public speaking. Now, when you are putting together a speech, and we're going to come back to this uh, later if we have time, but you have to face the fact that every speech has a purpose or several purposes. Now, the truth is every speech does have a general purpose, and that's mainly what's your reason for giving your speech? What is it that you are trying to accomplish? The three general purposes, as you can see here, is either you're trying to inform your audience, or you're trying to persuade them of something, or your speech is to meet some ceremonial function. Now, we can talk about these three different general categories of speeches, but the truth is that they overlap. There are 
um, elements of every type of speech in every speech that is given. And yet, the speaker planning the speech still needs to know what their general purpose is. What is it that they are really trying to accomplish? To simply inform their audience with their information, which is basically what I'm doing here, or to persuade their audience, which might be to increase their belief in something or motivate them to do something, or simply to inspire them in some regard? Or does it meet some ceremonial function? Ceremonial speeches uh, are things like uh, after dinner speeches and eulogies and award speeches and commemoration speeches. And the type of speech, based on the type of ceremony, type of speech is going to change. And so as a speaker, we need to remember that if I'm going to be meeting what are common expectations of this gathering, I need to know what is the purpose of the speech. Okay. Now, Moving on from there, along with the general purpose, you need to know what is the specific purpose. And re this really has to do with what is it that I want my audience to do when I'm finished? When my message is complete, what is it that I really want? What is the result I want with them? Okay. Now, this is not based on just what you want. Let's say you're a salesperson giving a presentation. We all know that there can be an, an, the unethical salesperson who uh, does and says anything to get what they want from the audience, or let's say the unethical politician who does and says anything to get what they want from the audience, and they'll use a lot of unethical means to do that. Okay, obviously this is wrong. We, if we're going to be uh, uh, an ethical speaker, we need to think about what is the specific purpose that I really want to accomplish with this audience while meeting their needs, not just your needs, but their needs. And so you need to consider what are the needs of my audience as it relates to my topic, as it relates to what I'm going to share with them, because I need to have some real empathy in that regard when I'm putting a speech together. I need to think about what is the level of this audience, uh, you know, within reason. Um, if I'm going to be sharing my information with them and it's highly complex, I need to accept the fact that this audience may or may not be ready for it. And if I uh, reasonably assume that they're not ready for this complexity of information, I need to bring it down to their level. And again, that takes real empathy to come up with a purpose that is reasonable in relation to the audience. When I leave this audience, what do I want them to know? What do I want them to think? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to do? Okay. And this purpose needs to be clear for you, the speaker. And in time, it needs to be very clear with the audience. When it is clear to the audience and in line with audience goals, guess what? You get their support. Okay. Now, support can run along a, a spectrum of, you know, of, as far as how much support uh, you might get, but you get their support. And sometimes their support is simply, I'm going to keep listening to you. I'm going to keep listening to you. I was speaking to a friend just a few days ago who uh, shared with me that uh, she happens to be a, a manager in, uh, in her company and she had to order some materials and she was speaking to a new salesperson or at least new for them. And she was uh, saying, you know, trying to choose the right materials and uh, the salesperson at first uh, wondered you know, what difference does it make as far as if there was a particular product, you know, it didn't matter. And uh, the, the friend of mine, she was basically pointing out that, wait a minute, I need more detail because I need this to fit my needs and my general objectives on my job. And uh, so, and, and she was telling me about it simply because in the conversation, it became much clearer to the salesperson, the importance of really, really, really being aware what her needs were. Okay, and as speakers, we need to give that some consideration. The difference is we need to consider these things before we even give the speech. When we uh, do that and we do it accurately and we do it effectively, then we end up receiving audiences, our audience's support. Now let's move on from uh, the purpose and talk about the function that the speaker and the audience plays in this ritual of public speaking. Uh, I, I, I'd like to, make a little point now that I know that um, a lot of people probably, obviously, why would you think of this unless you had to? Uh, some people might think that they'll go through their entire life and you know, not have to give any kind of speech. But the truth is, again, 
if you don't think of a speech as always a formal speech, most of us will end up having to give some kind of speech, okay, whether it's on our job or in our social gatherings. And uh, we need to, again, be thinking of these things as, you know, when we come into these situations. But what is the function of the speaker? Well, the function of the speaker, first and foremost, obviously, is to bring the message. But they need to be share, well, forming and sharing this message with what we call an I-thou mentality. An I-thou mentality. That means that I, the speaker, see the audience in a lofty way. I'm going to respect my audience. I'm going to plan and prepare my message to the best of my ability with them in mind and not just with my own, with my own goals in mind. The other way of looking at it, or the, the converse approach, shall we say, is I, it. And I, it is, I view my audience as an it, a thing that I can use for my own purposes. It is extremely unethical, and yet it is very common. When a speaker has an I, it approach to planning and presenting a speech, they are basically, their, their mentality is, whatever works, whatever works, say whatever needs to be said, even if it's wrong, even if it's knowingly wrong. Obviously, this is unacceptable and it's unethical, and yet, once again, it's so common. As a speaker, you want to come with an I-thou mentality to your preparation and to the delivery of your message. And, of course, you, the speaker, bring the message, okay? You bring the message. That kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? But what you need to think about is that your message has to be credible. You always need to understand that you, the speaker, bring the message, yes, but you also are a part of the message in the way the audience is uh, um, digesting your information. Message credibility me means that, yeah, it's believable. It's believable. But it had to be ethically formed and delivered because, let's face it, we all will believe a lot that is simply not true. And so we're trusting the speaker to bring a message that was ethically formed is going to be ethically delivered. Now, as the speaker, we also need to remember, once again, that that credibility is not just based on this message. It's also based on us, on who we are as a speaker, okay? Credibility is not just about trust. It's also about acceptance. Do we accept you as the messenger? As the messenger. And you are part of the message, and consequently, you don't want to be a bad part of your own message. You don't want to be a bad part of your own message by uh, violating your audience's sensibilities. This is why we have to give so much thought in even, in, in, in even how we present ourselves as a speaker outside of the message. Those two things in your audience's minds are linked. Do I believe the message? Do I trust and accept the speaker? Because if either one of those gets the answer no, then the audience member, it's not that they won't continue listening to you, but now your message is being filtered through uh, mistrust and negativity and doubt. Okay. Now, one thing we always need to point out is that the audience determines speaker credibility. Yeah, it's a perceptual thing. But you, the speaker, can still do things to increase the likelihood that they'll see you as credible. And part of that is to present yourself and your message in a way that is sincere and appropriate for the situation. So that's the function of the speaker. But what's the function of the audience? Because, again, they're part of this ritual. Well, the audience comes to listen. Enough said about that. But their listening is more important than we may think, because it is with their listening and with their, uh, the, the, their response that they motivate the speaker. Certainly, they motivate the speaker just by being there. But imagine the audience that is there and not responsive in a way that is appropriate for the situation and in a way that can be uh, really, uh, on some level, observed and perceived by the speaker. Okay. Now, when that audience, again, comes to listen, they have to remember that I'm not just here to receive a message. I am a part of this ritual. And so I have to be a positive part of that ritual. And every once in a while, we all know that there are those situations where people might break those rules. But in general, yeah, we have to face the fact that 
The speaker is bringing the message, the audience is listening to, to the message, but the truth is we're working together. We're working together in this ritual. Okay, so we all have, uh, again, a function to serve in this particular, um, uh, in this ritual, in this event. Now let's move on and talk about the expectations that the speaker and the audience members all bring to the situation. Again, some of these things are, they seem so simple, and, and they are. The truth is they are very simple, but simple simply means easy. Okay, let me rephrase. I just got that backwards. Simple doesn't always mean easy. Simple means not complicated. It really is simple, but it's not always easy. Okay. So what does the speaker bring in their expectations? Number one, obviously, they expect the audience to listen. They expect reasonable levels of respect, okay? They expect the audience to show support, but as we mentioned before, the support that is shown by the audience is often culturally based. I can tell you about a time that I, um, I went to, this is as an adult, uh, went to uh, a gathering, it was a spiritual gathering uh, that I was invited to, not to speak, but just uh, by a, a friend of, of mine who was a part of this uh, church. And they were having a special event. And the minister came in, uh, he was a guest minister. And uh, he um, got up and started delivering the message. And I will admit that as a speech teacher, I have to time speeches. And so when I'm listening to anyone speak after having done this so many years, it's just like internal clock that just comes on. I don't necessarily want it to come on, but it comes on. This gentleman had been going on for about 20, maybe 25 minutes when he said, my topic today is, and I will admit, inside, I went a little nuts. You've been speaking this long and you're just getting your topic? You're just getting to your topic? But guess what? He knew his audience. His audience loved him. I was the stranger in their midst. It might have been culturally uh, not within my comfort zone, but it was definitely within theirs. And basically, as a speaker, he knocked the ball out of the park. Okay, so a lot of the audience support is based on uh, their cultural, again, backgrounds. As a speaker, we should not be phony. We should not change who we are. But we do need to face the fact that that audience response is going to affect how we plan and deliver our message. Okay, so we as speakers bring expectations, but the audience also brings expectations. Okay, they once again, and I know that this is redundant, but guess what? Redundancy is a part of being an effective speaker. They expect their speaker to be prepared. They expect their speaker to be clear. They expect that speaker to be competent. They expect that speaker to be of good, of good character and reasonably dynamic reasonably dynamic. Obviously, that's a scale that may be very high in certain situations, but lower in certain situations, okay? And of course, appropriately formal. The rules of formality will change, again, from one culture to the next, from one venue to the next, from one situation to the next, and yet you are, there are still rules. The rules aren't written down, they're not discussed, and yet you know when someone has broken the rules because all of a sudden people just might actually show shock or, or, or show disapproval, okay? And the audience, again, expects the speaker to, to make a sincere attempt at connecting. Now let's talk about uh, the, let's just say the elephant in the room, uh, which is just basic speak, speaker anxiety. They still expect, it, speaker anxiety is normal, first and foremost. We need to point that out. It's normal. The audience still expects you to work beyond that. They understand you might be nervous. They're very, very understanding and even accepting of obvious anxiety. And, uh, audiences are very supportive in that regard because we show our humanity in that way in most cases. But they still expect the speaker to make a sincere attempt at connecting with them. There is no excuse for insincerity. Moving on. Now, how do we know when we have reached a level of success in this speech ritual? Well, number one, that undiscussed agreement between the speaker and the audience uh, basically occurs. We do come to that undiscussed agreement. We agree that the message was clear. 
we have a sense of completeness. We have a sense of closure. The audience leaves feeling that their time was not wasted. One thing you need to understand also is even though they might have heard the same message, most audience members are going to forget most of what you say. It's, it's basically part of the human condition. And yet, what they will take away from your speech is a, a positive sense that they have been served well on some level, okay? They will feel that their time has not been wasted. And of course, communication has occurred. That is the sign of ritualistic success in public speaking. When we left, how did we feel about the message? Even if I heard some things that I might disagree with, how did I feel about it in general? Did I feel offended? Did I feel that, uh, again, my time was wasted? Did I feel that, wow, that just went right over my head? Or on some level, did I, as a speaker, excuse me, feel a sense of connection? And did the speaker, if I am the speaker, did I feel a sense of connection with that audience? Okay. Now, communication in the ritual occurs when, number one, the attendant message generally, and again, I emphasize generally, matches the message that the audience understood. You may get a lot of questions. You may get very few questions, but you will, if, if, if it has gone well, you won't get, you'll often get some questions maybe for some additional clarity or additional detail that you couldn't cover in the time that you had. But hopefully you don't end up getting a lot of questions clearly showing that, wow, we just didn't understand that at all, okay? Communication in this ritual also occurs when the roles, relationships, and objectives of all the participants, both speaker and audience members, are clear, okay? We also have to face the fact that that this isn't that, that number one, we're not robots. We're human beings. We have thoughts. We have feelings. We have attitudes that we express. And these thoughts and feelings are, and attitudes are expressed both verbally and nonverbally. And it will vary from culture to culture to culture and from person to person. And yet it's still a part of this ritual. We also, if communication has occurred, then the wants and the needs and the instructions that were that should have been a part of the speech are, are identified. The message is generally direct. The message is generally clear. One thing, and this is this is uh, the last thing I'd like to cover here, is that we often, as speakers, put the emphasis on the content. And of course, the content is important. We can't deny that. That's why people come together. They do want the content. But in general communication, while the content is, of course, important, what's more important is the process. Every message that we convey, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or a speaker in a public speaking situation with an audience, every message has two levels, two levels. You have what is called uh, the uh, content message, which is, that's the content. That's pretty simple. Okay. Here's the content. This is what was said. This is what was under, what was understood. But then there is what we call the relational dimension of the message, or let's just call it the relational message. And the relational message is an indication of two things in a relationship, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or speaker and audience. And we say that those two things that the relation uh, the relational message carries is what we call state and status. The relational message is an indication of the state of the relationship. Are we with one another? Are we on the same page? Do we understand one another? But also the relational message is an indication of the status of that relationship. And the status being, how are we seeing our relationship? Do we see it in a positive way? Do we see that all the people in this relationship are sharing or, or at least are playing their roles the way they are supposed to? Or is there something wrong here that might make us feel uncomfortable about the, the way communication is occurring? So even in public speaking, 
there are those two levels of meaning, the content message that, of course, the speaker generally brings, and then there's that, that relational message that is, in, that is an indication of whether or not communication uh, was successful or not, successful or not. And if you are an effective speaker, usually you kept people listening. Now, please don't misunderstand. I don't think that, I, I think we all know that the speaker doesn't bear all of the responsibility in that regard. Sometimes there are audience members that have other uh, priorities out of necessity. But that not being the case, hopefully we can keep delivering our messages in a way that keep people listening without trying their patience as far as time is concerned. Okay, so once again, this, this whole thing about speech being a ritualistic process, that ritual will occur whether, we, whether it's uh, positive or not. But when it's positive and effective, we, uh, we meet those expectations that people bring into it. It can be met on a couple of different levels. There's an old Greek saying, and I'll finish with this, uh, and at least at this, with, with this segment. Uh, there's an old Greek saying that says, when Demosthenes speaks, the people say how well he speaks. But when Achilles speaks, the people say, let us march. And what that means is when Demosthenes speaks, we love to hear him talk. He is so entertaining. He's eloquent. Now maybe Achilles doesn't have that eloquence. Maybe Achilles is not as entertaining as Demosthenes. And yet there's something in the way he delivers that message that makes us want to get up and follow. That's what an effective speech can do. Maybe they won't literally follow you, but they'll keep your words and your thoughts in their mind, and they'll find value in them. Okay, now um, I'm going to stop right here for a moment and see, are there any questions? Uh, in public speaking circles, there is a general message that says, uh, you've probably heard of uh, the KIS method, KISS, I'm sorry, which is I'll keep it uh, nice and clean, keep it short and simple. Okay, I'm going to assume that uh, there are no questions at this time. And for the next few minutes, we're gonna go ahead and just talk about, okay, now that we've determined that this is a ritualistic thing, how do we go about putting a message together? Well, it might be simpler than you might think. Unfortunately, often when it's time for us to put together a message, we sit down, we've got a blank sheet of paper, which we might think of as our canvas, and sometimes nothing happens, or sometimes too much happens. So right now we're going to talk about how do we go about preparing a speech, no matter what the situation is, or no matter what might be the reason for this speech. Whenever you're preparing a speech, the first thing you always need to think about is your topic. Yeah, what's my topic going to be? Simple, but is it? Very often, people get stumped just by having to come up with a topic. And one of the reasons is because they forget about their most important starting point. And their most important starting point is themselves. You should always begin with you. What are your interests? What are your experiences? What is your area of knowledge or your areas of knowledge? And what are your concerns that you can start pulling from? This doesn't mean you have to go, you don't have to go out and get other information. But at least as a starting point, you don't have to manufacture interest. You don't have to manufacture enthusiasm. You actually already have a starting point in that regard. But we do need to point out that you do not want to confuse topic with subject area. A topic choice is very, very narrow. It's very narrow. It is not general. Like, again, a subject area is. Let's say um, we're talking about the Baha'i faith. Well, if I'm going to tell you and say, I want to tell you about the Baha'i faith, guess what? I could talk until the end of time because there's so much. I need to, it's not that it's not okay to start out that way, but somewhere in there, I need to know what aspect of this spiritual walk do I really want to pinpoint? Then I can choose a topic. It's not general. It is very specific, it is very narrow, and it is very focused on just a very narrow aspect of this general subject area. Many people make the mistake of 
you know, they'll come up with a topic that, uh, you know, that they think is a topic, let's put it that way. And it really is just a subject area. Why in the world is this a challenge? It's a challenge because if we are going to, I'm going to uh, go back for a second here, if we are going to choose a topic that's based on our own interests, experiences, knowledge, and concerns, guess what? There's a lot because you already know so much. And yet you have to approach an audience with a much narrower aspect of all that you know in that one subject area or that one topic. So yeah, it needs to be specific, it needs to be very narrow and very focused. Now, we already talked about purpose, but you once again, you need to know what your purpose is. What's your general purpose? Again, am I here just to inform? Am I here to persuade? Am I here to entertain? Am I here to do some combination thereof? And then next to that, once again, what's my specific purpose? What is it really that I want to accomplish with this particular audience? You need to know who that audience is to know what your specific objective is. And then you need to be able to know what are the main divisions of my speech? What are the main parts of this big idea? Because that's really what your speech has one big idea and that's your topic, but you have to chop that down or cut that into separate parts. What are the main points that you want to emphasize? And you don't want to have more than five main points. Why, why would five be the limit? Because beyond five main points, and this is basically how you decide to divide your information. Beyond five main points, people have more and more problems remembering. Why? Part of the human condition. You want to limit yourself to five main points. And admittedly, uh, there are some people that out of necessity may have to violate that rule. But you do need to know that if you are sharing more than five main points in a speech, you are making it more difficult for your audience to mentally organize your information and hold on to more of it in their memory. So you need to know what your main points are. I mentioned the big idea. The big idea in academic circles would be called your thesis statement. Okay, that big idea is your speech plus the main points. And it is basically one statement that mentions nothing but your topic and your main points. This is your starting point. Why do I have something there about racquetball? Because that's my, you know, I love racquetball. I play a lot of racquetball. I play so much racquetball that if I wanted to talk to you about racquetball, you couldn't leave for days. But you wouldn't listen for that long, would you? No, you wouldn't. You'd listen for maybe about five minutes and then you'd start looking at your watch. You might be looking at your watch already. When I'm talking about, let's say again, if I choose to talk about racquetball ball, I might have to settle on one thing. Racquetball forehand. How do I hit a racquetball forehand? And break that down into just three main points, the stance, the grip, and the swing. If I chose to talk about the Baha'i faith, I might have to settle for a very brief history of the faith, the basics of the precepts of our faith, and how you could possibly uh, find more information. Okay, bottom line is I have to face the fact that it doesn't matter how much I know. I have to keep it simple for my audience so that I'm really not trying their patience with excess uh, uh, complications or excess complexity rather, but I'm also not trying their patience in regards to how much time they're willing to give this topic. It's good to know who your audience is. It's difficult to find out, but if you can, you can do what is called an audience or situational analysis by actually considering that audience before you've even written the speech. How old is this audience probably going to be? What are some of the uh, cultural attributes that they may have? Sometimes things may come into play like age, socioeconomic level, uh, religious backgrounds, uh, lifestyle choices that we and, and uh, ways of thinking that may be a part of how they process your message. You need to think about this before you have gotten in front of that audience and given that speech. Um, it may surprise some of you to know that even professional speakers, let's say they're out there on the speech circuit, they're traveling the world when we're able to travel the world, and uh, most of the time they're speaking on one thing. Often they're only giving really one speech but they're tweaking it for each audience. And that's what we have to do. It's not just based on what we know and what we love. It is who is this audience and how can I customize this speech just for them? And once again, I mentioned audience analysis where you're, you're doing, you know, you're trying to find out as much about your audience as possible. Well, sometimes you can't. Sometimes the only thing you have is what's the situation I'm speaking in? Where am I going to be speaking? 
what's the time of day that I'm going to be speaking, how long will I have to speak, and what's the size of the audience estimated to be. Because that is going to have, those factors are going to have a major impact on how you shape that message. You need to have those things in mind. Now, we mentioned credibility. Once again, I, I wasn't able to spend a lot of time on credibility, but credibility is believability. The ability to get people to believe and trust you. And as I mentioned earlier, only your audience really decides your credibility because credibility is a perceptual thing. You may be the most honest person in the world, sharing 100% accurate information, and yet your audience, for whatever reason, doesn't connect and consequently doesn't accept and trust you. If you don't determine your credibility, how can you affect the audience's perception of your credibility? Well, you see the word there, it's authenticity, by being truly authentic, by being sincere in your preparation and delivery, by presenting yourself in the most appropriate way, yes, but also presenting a part of who you really are. You do not control the audience's perception of, credi of your credibility, but you do control their, your, their perception of your authenticity. You control your authenticity through presenting your information in a competent way as a person of good character with some of the better parts of your personality showing some charisma and having a very clear message, okay? In other words, present yourself in a knowledgeable way, an ethical, an ethical way rather, having some real personality and presenting your information in an organized way. Why do I have physical attractiveness there? There's a reason, folks, because physical attractiveness matters. And let's face it, some people have what we call, the, they hit the biological lottery and they're amazing to look at. That's a small part of a speech, but it won't keep people listening. We can all present ourselves in the best possible way, visually and verbally and non-verbally, and basically package ourselves in a way that an audience will feel comfortable with and even feel pleased with. The way you package yourself, what we call that is image management. The way you manage your image as a speaker will affect how your audience uh, 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 accepts you. This doesn't mean you always have to look like you're ready to defend someone in court. I always say that to my students. But you do have to present yourself in a way that you can be sure your audience will find respectful of themselves, respectful of who you are, and not, again, see you in a way that is off-putting. This is an uncomfortable thing to share because often in our culture, uh, you know, we're very individualistic, but we have to face the fact that we're sharing, once again, in a ritual and we need to present ourselves in a way that's appropriate for this ritual. When we do so, hopefully our audience gives us what is called initial credibility where they accept us uh, immediately. But guess what? Even the most visually appealing person, that initial credibility doesn't go very far nor does it last very long. The rest you have to earn and you earn it in the way that you present your information and in the way that you connect with your audience. And this is called acquired credibility, okay? So yeah, they're both important. Face the fact that the way you visually present yourself does matter. Is it the primary factor? No, it is not, but it is a factor. Now, uh, this is the last thing that we're going to be covering. And it's just a, a visual that lets you know that uh, when effective speakers are putting their messages together, they're following a very, very simple recipe, frankly, a very simple structure. And that simple, that, that structure is simply an, an introduction, a body with two to five main points, once again, and a conclusion. That introduction has, each of these parts of a speech has things to do, okay? The introduction, the first thing you want to do is get their attention in an effective way. Or, or, okay, get their attention in an effective way, in an appropriate way. Then, after having gotten their attention in an appropriate way, you specify what you're going to be talking about. Give them a preview after that, where you simply list, these are the things we're going to cover. And if necessary, even take a moment and share with them why, you know, why, they can, uh, why you are able to deliver this information with them. You might talk about your background, your experiences, things of that nature that qualify you to speak on this particular topic. Okay at the top of this lecture or lecture or this talk, uh, you know, uh, uh, my good friend John give, gave an introduction. There was a reason for that. 
there is a reason beyond just telling you who is this person. It's also to, in a roundabout way, let the audience know the topic that this person is choosing to talk about is something that you can trust them with. Okay. Now, after you've gotten through the introduction, you can go ahead and actually get into your main points and share them in the way that you want to. Now, we've got claims and facts and statistics and so forth there. The bottom line is you want to share the information that you feel is important. You need to know, however, that your speech is probably going to fall in, the information is probably going to fall in some kind of pattern in the body. Either it's going to be uh, in a list of steps based on time, sometimes it's called a process speech, often how to do something or when certain events occurred, or it might be some kind of a physical description where you are describing something, talking about how something looks. Or you might be talking about a problem and how to solve it, problem and solution. Or perhaps you might be uh, actually talking about uh, in, in a way uh, where you are talking about what caused a set of a, a situation to occur, what we call simply causal, a cause effect. This is what made this happen, and this is what has brought about uh, current circumstances. Okay, it's what we call causal reasoning. Or maybe you want to um, persuade your audience. And there is a particular way of persuading your audience is a five-step process called the motivated sequence, where you actually are going through a five through five steps, where you are presenting a need to your audience. You want them to consider that this need exists, that there's a way to satisfy that need and so forth. The main point here being, you need to understand that effective speakers have a pattern that they usually are falling in. Now, one extremely common pattern, and this is the last one I'll list, is what we call the narrative pattern. Everyone has heard speakers that either their whole speech was their story or was a series of stories to make a point. That's what the narrative pattern is. And you may choose to just tell your life story as it relates to that situation. Guess what? Your information is falling into a pattern. And that's the narrative pattern. The main thing here is you need to know that your information needs to be logically sequenced. So that, again, from your audience's standpoint, remember that thing, empathy? We need to be thinking about not, is this clear to me, but will it be clear to them? Will it be clear to them? And if it's clear to them, well, then you've done your job. But do know that you've done, you, you have some uh, choices to make there. And then finally, after you've covered all of your information, whether it was to inform them or persuade them or simply to inspire them on some level, you then have to summarize and close. Now, admittedly, some speeches don't need a summary. A lot of ceremonial speeches don't need you to relist your main points, but you do need to close, okay? Certain speeches, if they're persuasive or informative, they need a summary. So you can remind your audience, again, being deliberately redundant, this is what we talked about. And then finally, put a good closing line on. A good closing line often is a quote, or it's something that will motivate your audience and it will give them that sense of closure uh, from your message. Okay, now I know this is an awful lot of information to cover in one hour. Hopefully, uh, uh, it, it's as simple as, as it should have been. Uh, it's, we it's actually do have some questions, about though. That as we speak to people, we don't think about merely what we know and what we want to talk about. We need to, to the extent that we can, uh, cover that information in a way that is appropriate for the listener. I'm going to go ahead and say one final thing here, and that's as being a Baha'i, one of the uh, features of the Baha'i faith, one of the uh, attributes or precepts of the faith is that we have no ministers, no ministers, okay? We have an organization. There is a very clearly defined organization. There is very clear guidance, and yet there is no set-aside class of people that we all ministers. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if we had ministers, let's face it, there would be those people that we would be designated speakers all the time. Well, because we are all supposed to be acting as ministers, we have to face the fact that often we are the speakers. And when we get in our gatherings, and when we get with other people that may not be used to you know, our way of gathering. We need to keep all of those other people in mind and form and deliver our messages in ways that are appropriate for them. 
thank you very much for listening. I see that we have some questions here. What are the questions, Tim? Yeah, so one of the first questions we got is uh, from Nancy from Georgia. Mm -hmm. She's asking a question. She says, isn't it a good thing to receive questions at the end of your speech? It means they're in tune and interested in what you have to say. I am just saying because when I hear a speaker and I start asking questions, it only means I'm engaged and I'm very interested in finding out more. That is Nancy from Georgia. And thank you very much for that question, Nancy. And that's an excellent question. And the short answer is absolutely. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and share a little personal note here. Thank you so much for asking your question. <laughs> because a, a speaker often, once they're, they're finished, uh, if time allows, uh, the feeling that they might get if there are no questions is that the audience simply wasn't on some level interested. Uh, and so when people ask questions, that means that they find, they found value in what was being shared and they want more information. So again, thank you. But yes, I absolutely agree with you on that. Uh, questions are uh, the ethical prepared speaker. Let me qualify my statement. The ethical prepared speaker always wants questions if time allows. Yes. Another question. Yeah, so the next question comes from, let's see, comes from Alex from St. Pete Beach, Florida. Can you I, mention some techniques to overcome stage fright? <laughs> this might include reliance on the Holy Spirit and having an attitude of sharing one's talk as a service. <laughs> Alex. I, I hate to laugh at the question because it's an excellent question. It's a question that millions and millions of people would love to have the answer to. Here's the bad news, Alex. You won't overcome what we call speech anxiety or what's more commonly called stage fright. You won't overcome it. Here's the good news. You don't want to overcome it. What you want to do is learn to manage it. Stage fright or speech anxiety or speaker apprehension, whatever you want to call it, is yeah, it, it, it can be stifling, but it's a double-edged sword. It's also a source of energy. And if you can learn to manage your anxiety, it can become a source of energy. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you some things that you can do. Again, it's not gonna get, help you get rid of your anxiety and you don't want to, but you do want to reframe that anxiety to turn it into a positive, okay? First and foremost, I'll say that the primary cause of, of, of speech anxiety is a sense of um, unpreparedness. We can, uh, uh, let, I'm gonna reframe that to unpredictability. We don't know what the audience is going to do. Well, guess what, you, 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 change your focus to things that you can control. What can you control? You can control your preparation and your delivery. Certainly you want to do that with the audience in mind, but you also need to change your perception of the whole speaking situation. How, what happens uh, 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 when we communicate with one another? Well, if it's in a situation that is what we call an interpersonal situation, usually one-on-one -on -one or just a group of people, small group of people talking, we're not nervous. Why aren't we nervous in most cases? It's because we do this all the time. Now, let's move that into a public speaking situation. Most of what's occurring are things that we still do all the time. Some of the details have changed, okay? Some of the, you know, um, the basic elements have changed. Now, let's face it, yeah, you're doing all the talking, okay? Because that's what a speech is. But face the fact that your audience is only, number one, they want to be your support group. They expended the energy to come and hear you. They did not come up and say, hey, do you have a script of your speech that I can just take home and read in my own time? No, they want to hear you, but they want to hear the real you. They want to hear the prepared you, yes, but they want to have a, an, an, an experience of connecting with other human beings or with another human being, and in this case, that other human being is you. So examine your perception of the situation. See it for having the positive value that it does. Face the fact that people are coming to hear you because they really want to hear you. They're not doing something they don't want to do. 
and they do have those expectations we talked about earlier. Of course, they expect you to be uh, um, prepared, but also uh, you also want to see yourself as the leader. The leader. How often is it that we get a chance to stand in front of an audience of people or a group of people and for a, a certain amount of time, whatever the amount of time is, they give us permission to share whatever we want to. How often do we get that? We don't get that that often. And so we need to appreciate it for what it is. We need to appreciate it for what it is. Now, having said that, there are also some other more practical things that you can do uh, that are just, I shouldn't say more practical, but simply practical things. And some of them are just basic stress management types of things. Okay. Uh, think about what happens to you if you do get nervous. Um, like right now, this is almost finished, so I'm not going to get some water. I, I would have to get up, leave the screen, or leave the you know camera shot and go get some water. But I often get a dry mouth. Normally what I do, is you have something to drink. Speakers do this all the time. Well, you know, the audience doesn't know that you've got a dry mouth, but hey, you do, and it's a bit of a distraction. Okay, so that can kind of increase the anxiety a little bit. Have something to drink. If you are a perspiro, as I often am, have something to wipe your brow with, wipe your hands with, if you happen to be a Sunday morning Southern Baptist minister, you can use that handkerchief as a prop, okay? But have that there with you, okay? Now, uh, also, let's say you haven't started speaking yet. Let's say even in the planning phases, just like any other endeavor where you feel challenged, use some positive thinking techniques. See yourself going through what you've done. See yourself being or what you're going to do. See yourself in a very concrete way, being uh, very successful. And I mean, actually going through the steps because it's been scientifically proven that that kind of practice enhances physical practice, okay? That mental practice enhances physical practice and athletes and so forth use this all the time, okay? So uh, again, another thing we need to remember is don't think you have to be more than you. You have to be prepared, you. You have to be a positive version of you. But you don't have to be more than you really are. Don't think you have to come to your audience being some phony version of yourself. No, be appropriate, be sincere, but still be you. Uh, there are some other things. I mean, I could get a lot deeper when it comes to anxiety, but the you know, in the final analysis, we have to accept that it's a part of it. We have to accept that with more speaking experience, uh, you know, it will lower, but we'll still have that anxiety to manage. Even if someone tells you that they don't get nervous about, about public speaking, are they lying? No, but they're, they're not really accurate. It's just that their uh, anxiety, they've learned to channel it in a more positive way and, uh, you know, and, and make it work for them. And we can all do that. We can all do that. Okay. So we got another question, and uh, this question is from Gilbert from Clearwater. Could you hey, please Gilbert. tell us how do you present a subject that is opposite of common belief? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Gilbert, I know you. That's a toughie. The, what I would dare say first and foremost is, is you want to establish a comfort level by establishing an area of commonality, first and foremost. Start with what you know everyone agrees with. Start with what you know everyone agrees with. We also have to accept, accept the fact that if we are speaking to an audience on some things that we, are, or we go into knowing they don't agree, our purpose is probably to try and move them from disagreement, or let's call it hostility. And we're probably trying to persuade them in our direction. So how do we do that? Well, there are many different ways, but in general, what we're trying to do is slide them along a spectrum of persuasion from absolute hostility to something closer to, uh, uh, to support. And often looking at support or agreement, if you will, might be unrealistic. But if we can move them anywhere in the direction from, again, hostility, to, uh, to support, a lot of times we might take them closer to an area that we can just call neutrality, where now, they, at first they were completely against what we believed or what we shared, what, what we knew, and uh, 
uh, we now have them at the point where now they're questioning their own views. And questioning might not be the better word, examining their own views. Now we've got to a point where, if they're willing, we can truly open up a dialogue. But we first start with areas of agreement and then move into, and, and, and I should point out that those areas of agreement are irreputable because they're absolute. They're things that everyone knows. This is just fact. Now, when we're doing what we call proposition of fact, which is, I think, applies to your question, what we, there are different propositions, different ways of, of presenting, uh, uh, let's say, an argument. And one is called proposition of fact. Proposition of fact means that the speaker is actually uh, speaking from the uh, mindset that my audience either is misinformed or they simply, and doesn't, and, and they don't know it, or they know nothing about this. Now, the truth is the audience that knows nothing is probably going to be less of a challenge than the audience that is misinformed. Okay, so start from what we can already agree on and once we have, uh, uh, you know, reached the point where, yeah, we're all in agreement on this, now we can go into areas that might be either, uh, again, new for our audience or areas where that audience um, has some preconceived notions that they have not questioned. And once we can get them questioning their preconceived, unfounded notions, we can possibly open up a door for a greater dialogue, maybe even an ongoing dialogue. The truth is about persuasion is it rarely happens in just, you know, one shot if you're dealing with, with a hostile audience, unless uh, they're just, you know, they're ready. Uh, effective speaking, especially effective persuasion. Number one, it's, it's not science. I wish it were. It's a combination of science, art, and luck. And a lot of times it means we have to keep going back. The science is the facts, the statistics. The irreputable, absolute information. That's the science. The art is weaving that irreputable information with our approach and with the other, you know, maybe opinionated statements or claims that we mix in with them so that we soften it so that our audience, our hostile audience, will keep listening. Maybe still disagreeing, but keep listening. Okay? But okay, there's the science, there's the art, where's the luck? The luck is hopefully reaching them at a time when they're willing. We cannot make anyone listen, okay? And if we're going to be ethical speakers, we all know that doesn't mean that we should be uh, coercing, lying, forcing. And, and I know that, that your question is, how do I keep people really listening when, when, when you know, they disagree? But again, start with the areas that you can be sure they're going to agree with this. And then hopefully, you know, without too many jarring statements move them closer to an area of, uh, of, um, of, of agreement. Because often what will happen over time is they will convince themselves with the information that you are sharing with them. But we have to keep them in a mindset of, uh, of, of staying open-minded. So we can still share, again, factually, uh, ethical and factual and ethical information with them. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'll stop right there. Because I, I have a couple of other things I wanted to say, but it would just be a bit more redundant. Any other questions? That was a great answer to a great question. And actually, I wanted to ask something along those lines myself. Sure. And the question specifically is, would you recommend or how would you recommend talking about with people about subjects such as well, the, the biggest questions in life, like the existence of a God, and most importantly, talking about spiritual concepts that could be a little more difficult for people to get just because they haven't been exposed to it before. How would you, in this concept, like Plato in the uh, allegory of the cave, explain something to people who haven't yet grasped or they never knew they had the capacity yet to grasp these kinds of concepts. Well, I think the first thing we have to do is meet them where they are. Okay. And that, and that does, so doesn't mean just physically, but, uh, you know, mentally, if we can meet them where they are and uh, maybe even, uh, again, put them in a questioning mindset, 
and face the fact that um, part of communication and persuasion is uh, voluntary participation. And when people don't want to participate, number one, and I know this goes without saying, but we obviously can't force them to do so. There's a little bit of beating of the bushes that goes along with sharing uh, these high level top types of discussions. There, there, there is some beating of the bushes. When I say that, I mean, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, we want to qualify our audience, but how can you qualify an audience that you don't know where they are? It's very difficult. And so some of it, again, that's where some of the luck comes in. But once they have, once they have agreed on some level to participate in opening up a dialogue, we have to tread very lightly. I'm going to share a personal story uh, to make the point. Uh, as, as you all know, I'm, I'm Baha'i and uh, I didn't grow up Baha'i. I grew up Southern Baptist and part of the general belief, whether it's cultural or not, was you don't even listen to other possibilities. Now, did anyone say that to me? No, but it was in there. And I still remember the first time I heard about the Baha'i faith, I shut down mentally. It had, I, it did, if it wasn't saying Jesus, I didn't want it nothing to do with it. Okay, uh, now it wasn't the speaker's fault. They were very kind. They were very kind, very loving but it wasn't packaged in a way that I was ready to hear. Okay, and Abdu'l-Baha and Baha'u'llah both talk about the fact that, yeah, you know, uh, you, if they're not ready, you got to keep on walking. The way Jesus said it is you can't put new wine into old wineskins. Sometimes people just aren't ready. But if we don't come in beating people over the heads, if we emphasize areas of commonality, hopefully they're more willing to keep listening. Uh, there is this uh, text, I do not remember the author, but it's called, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And that's, that's a passage from the Bible that emphasizes reasoning. Now, that means that we've got to be, to find those people and approach them in a way that, number one, won't be off-putting to them. That means that, yeah, a lot of times uh, we've got to shorten our message, keep it shorter than we might among Baha'is. Uh, we've got to, and I know that's not what you're just asking about, but to, to stick with that example, you've got to shorten our message. We often have to simplify the message. Again, face the fact that my level of knowledge does not dictate what is appropriate for this particular situation. For this particular situation, may, maybe my first job is not to run the person away with too much information or with making it too complex, even though I'm bursting at the seams wanting to share this message. And so, again, it might be instead of, you know, sharing this complex story, I might have to break it down to just a few things that they're not just ready, but willing to listen to. And, uh, you know, accept the fact that um, while they, um, while we would love them to, for them to stay and keep listening, some people are going to hear something that they're not comfortable with and they're just going to go. And we need to be willing and willing to accept that. Okay. But we're told still, you know, speak lovingly and, and share with people, you know, in a way that again, that's the words aren't comfortable. That that's, uh, that's just my words that are generally comfortable in the way that it's presented. We can't change the facts, but we can uh, present it in a way where uh, the level of information we're giving them is hopefully within their sensibilities so that they're still willing to keep listening, maybe even if not in that sitting, okay? I said I was going to share a personal story, and, and, and I said the first time that I heard about the faith, yeah, didn't want to listen one bit. So how, did I, how do I sit here as, a, you know, as a totally 100% believing Baha'i? It is because the second time that I encountered a believer and entered a dialogue with that person, number one, I was ready. But also the way she presented her information did not uh, fill me with such a level of discomfort that I shut down the dialogue. Okay, don't get me wrong. There was a little bit of discomfort about certain things, but she fed me in small bites and took me along and allowed me to determine how do I want to go along on this journey? 
and well again here I sit today but I think it was with the gentleness with the small bits with the staying within my comfort level and you can feel people's comfort level often with what they share with you you can define what the comfort level is okay any other questions so a follow-up to that, since you mentioned about small bites and you mentioned about commonality, that got me thinking of the transitive property of equality, where effectively you take three separate things and you have one thing in the middle, A equals B, B equals C, so therefore A equals C. That's a transitive property of equality. So you're saying if you work with an area of commonality and you take what seems like two separate things, but you show how they're exactly the same, people are easy, easier to understand, to be open to, and to believe that than they are to what they deem to be completely separate concepts, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and we, we, that's one of those things that we have to understand is a lot of times people feel that we're at odds when we're not. It's just a matter of we haven't spoken their language yet. We have to find their language. To present our ideas because ideas our thoughts they're you know they're they're not concrete we have to put them into words that are concrete we have to choose our words very carefully in a way that again keeps them listening because on some level they can they can sense that commonality um imagine the person who what they're saying that where what you're saying is something that they're comfortable with that they're uncomfortable with uh on some level and yet you're presenting it in such a way, choosing your words so carefully and using even your nonverbal uh, cues uh, in such a way that it makes them decide that, okay, I'll keep listening. We have to keep them listening because once they stop listening, it no longer matters what we say. And it's a lot easier for us to sit here and talk about the dead than it is to do, but it's still necessary to do that. So again, measure doses of whatever it is you're trying to share through first establishing the commonality and even not in a way on uh, the, the, the way that it sounds like I'm challenging you. Once they sense challenge, a lot of people are gonna be put off anyway. Now they're digging their heels in. Now they're building walls. But imagine, again, uh, uh, emphasizing those areas of agreement and using them as bridges to new information that is also difficult to agree with because it just makes sense. Now, we still can't take responsibility for what that other person may decide in the end, but our main thing, no matter what it is you're trying to do, uh, very often is a lot of times we think about the end without considering the process. We have to remember that at least a part of the process is to the extent that is within our control, we've got to try and keep people listening. Well, if people have reason to shut down, it's not necessarily our fault, but the result is the same. And some people are gonna shut down no matter what you do. And some people, again, that's science, art, and luck, you got to them, you're sharing facts with them at the right time and in the right way so that they keep listening and in time before you know it, they are thinking things that they might have been have, 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 might not have been thinking at the beginning of the process of interacting with them. And yet over time they become more and more comfortable with that information. But if we try and you know stick a funnel in their mouth and jam too much in their brain, uh, that usually is not very effective. It works sometimes. I mean, the other side of my story is I had a roommate at the time who had also never heard of the Baha'i faith, and he jumped on board that night. What was the difference? I don't know. I just know that um, uh, some people are ready for whatever it is you want to share with them, and some people are not. We obviously have to try, and, and whatever our efforts are may be, and whatever the endeavor and the objective may be, we have to be able to present our information to an audience that is, might not be at first willing to jump on board, but at least willing to listen. And the rest is part of that process of keeping their minds open while we're sharing whatever information it is that we need to share with them. So we have a question from Eugene from Clearwater. And okay. I think this is a great top off question for everything that we got here today. For people who want to learn how to do public speaking, uh, first he asked if you came across Postmasters ever and if you yourself got any formal or informal training in public speaking. And if you think that, uh, would you say your presentation is enough or would you take, 
other steps? Would you recommend that people like Eugene take certain steps like joining Toastmasters or any other systematic approaches after this presentation? Well, there are many courses that you can take. I certainly would recommend Toastmasters because that gives you, number one, you're around other people who have common goals in that regard when it comes to public speaking, and you get a lot of practice, okay? Uh, you know, because like anything, you know, we, we've heard the dynamic speakers. They weren't born dynamic speakers. They weren't born speaking. Many of them have either taken courses and, or they've gotten the type of life experience that has allowed them to develop those skills. Okay, so studying public speaking, uh, taking, a, taking a college course. I mean, again, I work at St. Petersburg College, uh, you know, a little plug there, but there are plenty of other schools that a basic speech course uh, certainly could be in order. Um, and, and, and I would dare say uh, taking a specifically, more specifically, a public speaking course, uh, particularly for someone who is truly motivated, that's always a good idea. Public speaking, uh, the study of public speaking and the ability to share with people, you know, in various venues through the uh, process of a public speech, uh, it certainly was, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor. It's a worthwhile endeavor. Well, thank you folks. And uh, I, I see we've got a little sign. You're saying we're over time. So we're over time. And I want to thank you all for listening and thank you so much for your questions. Hopefully you got something out of it. You all have yourselves a good day and a good week. And please, please, please stay safe. Bye-bye. And most importantly, if anyone has any further questions as a result of listening to this and you're listening to our past recording, please leave comments on this video. If you're on YouTube, on Facebook, we will get answers to you. We will try to ask Tony himself and get those answers to you. Again, on the Facebook page for Baha'i Center of Clearwater or the YouTube channel, if you are listening, please feel free, ask your questions in the comments below, and we will be more than happy to get back with you. Thank you, Tony, so much for appearing today. Thank you. Goodbye, Good. everybody.